Hi everybody, welcome to Scuba Diver Magazine. In today's top 10, we're breaking down the top 10 things that new scuba divers can often get wrong. Usually through no fault of their own, there's no shame here. It's just the little things and like idiosyncrasies that aren't always necessarily taught in your foundational courses. And unless you're like a savant, chances are that something is going to break or go wrong for you to find some of these out on your own or if someone tells you. Leaving your cylinders standing upright. This is a tricky one because in some circumstances, you're actually supposed to leave your tanks upright. When they're being stored for long periods, it's actually better if you leave them standing upright. And a lot of cylinders, they'll have flat bottoms so that they can stand up by themselves. And the cylinders that don't have round bottoms will have a rubber boot so that they can stand upright. So everything is leaning towards cylinders standing upright. But the thing to remember is that you shouldn't leave a cylinder standing upright unattended and unsecure. On a boat that's rocking and on just uneven ground, it's easy for tanks to just fall over and damage something. Because they're tall and heavy and often have a lot of your expensive dive equipment attached to them, cylinders can fall over and damage themselves, your dive kit and whatever they land on, which is either going to be the deck of the boat or your foot. So if you're handling cylinders, try and lay them down as much as possible and better yet, strap it down so it can't roll around. If there's some kind of cradle, to lay them down or stand them upright, to hold the cylinder in the right position, that's fine, but never leave a cylinder standing upright where it might topple over. And if there is a way to lash it to a rail or something, then make sure that it's really tight so that the tank can't rock and then eventually break free. Not preparing your dive mask properly or enough. Dive masks, when they're brand new especially, need to be prepared more than just spit and a quick rub with some defog gel before you jump in. There are two stages to a fog-free mask. Number one, with a brand new mask, you need an initial preparation to remove a film of release agent on the inside of the glass that comes from the manufacturing process that actually causes the mask lens to fog up very quickly. You need to scrub that off. Now, there are a few different ways to do this. Uh, there's going to be videos online to, uh, to help you out how to do it. And most of them need to be repeated more than once to be effective. It's not just a one and gun and you're ready to go. This you only need to do when your mask is very new and sometimes periodically throughout its life. Normally after the down period, it's good to do that initial preparation again. The second thing is preparing your mask right before every single dive. And after that initial preparation, a mask will still fog up, just not as easily. Spit and other defog solutions on the inside of the lens help to create a new temporary film that prevents water droplets from condensing on the inside. So with any mask, even the most expensive ones, prepare it properly first and then defog it before every dive to prevent fogging. New divers often carry far too much lead on their weight belt. When most divers first start out, they tend to hold a bit too much air in their lungs through a little bit of apprehension. Your, your body is still telling you in your mind to you know, hold your breath a little bit underwater and this can cause you to be a bit more buoyant than a little bit later. When you do your check dives and your weight checks when you're first starting out, you of course need more lead to help you get down and that additional amount of lead just sticks in your mind as, well, you know, that's the amount of lead that you really need to get underwater going forwards and you just stick with it. However, as you progress and you start to relax into your scuba diving, you can actually leave a fair amount of that extra lead behind and still sink with less lead because you're just not carrying as much buoyancy in your lungs. It's not just that that extra lead is heavy. Yes, that sucks. But carrying too much lead on your weight belt can actually increase your air consumption. Because you put more air in your BCD and you adjust your buoyancy more often to compensate for that extra lead, you're actually wasting a lot of breathing gas just compensating for that extra lead. When you're at like dive number 20 or something, 
do yourself a favor and do a proper weight check, a proper weight check, and see just how much lead you can take off from your weight belt and still be able to get down. Not respecting your boundaries. Now, there's an actual name for this, and it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. When you very first start out, you're very nervous, so you're naturally cautious and less likely to get into certain kinds of trouble. But as you progress a little bit and gain a bit more confidence in yourself, you start to push your boundaries a little bit too far sometimes because, well, nothing bad has happened so far. But this is the exact point where you need to have the most respect for your boundaries. Diving down too deep or into overhead environments like shipwrecks and caves is very dangerous if you haven't had the correct training. Of course, you don't know about the inherent dangers of those places and you might not be carrying the correct equipment. The important thing is, is to remain humble and if you want to dive in shipwrecks or caves or down deeper to deeper depths, then sign up for a course and do it properly. If you just do it yourself, you can end up getting yourself into some trouble and it's really not worth it. There's a reason why these courses exist. On a similar tack, succumbing to peer pressure. The only person that can make you go on a dive or go into a certain place underwater is you. If you don't like the feel of the dive plan or a certain section of it, then it's up to you to just say, no thanks, and put your foot down. And the flip side of that, if your buddy says no to something, honor it and don't push the issue. If they don't want to do it, just skip the dive or that section of the dive. If you push the issue and then go on a dive that you or they're not comfortable with or you go somewhere that you're untrained, then chances increase for something bad to happen. I'd far rather an unexperienced or unsure diver that I'm diving with be honest and say, you know, they don't want to do something, then we go on that dive and something bad happen. If you don't want to do something, then no means no. Not streamlining yourself and your equipment. A lot of scuba diving is about bringing redundant equipment for safety, but try to resist the temptation to bring absolutely everything from your kit bag with you on a dive, or at least every single dive. While there is certain equipment that comes with me on every single dive, like a compass and certain things, other bits and bobs can be a bit more dive specific and you know left behind unless I'm really sure that I need it. And you can't or shouldn't just clip everything off to a D-ring because you're increasing your work in the water by increasing the drag and of course chances of something being damaged, either your equipment or the reef. We actually have a term for this when people clip things off onto themselves. It's called a Christmas tree diver because you just have everything dangling off yourself like a Christmas tree and they're all just flappy snag hazards that can get caught in things and tangle you up underwater. So so if you do need to bring something down with you, stow it in a pocket to keep yourself nice and streamlined, reduce drag and reduce the chances of your kit and the reef from being damaged by hitting rocks and things. And try to think properly if you'll actually need to bring each piece of gear with you on that dive or if it's just a bit too excessive to bring it down with you. Not being honest about your gas consumption or checking your gauges often enough. I fully understand the social stigma of breathing more gas than your buddy, but honestly, no one really minds if you're a little bit low on a gas from a short fill or breathing a bit too heavy during the dive, but it's important for us to know the correct information because we make plans on the go based on remaining gas pressures. Sure, we have contingencies, um, but those contingencies only work if everybody sticks to them. That red zone, for example, in your SPG, it's not an arbitrary amount of gas. It's made so that two divers can complete a safety stop breathing from a single cylinder. If you're not being honest about the amount of gas you have left in your cylinder and then something uh, wrong happens to your buddy's gear, now you don't have enough gas to complete a proper safety stop between the two of you. It's far better to just be honest and end the dive a little bit earlier. There's always going to be a chance for another dive if you miss out on something. 
not paying attention to your surroundings. When diving with all the gear, a lot of new divers, they end up bumping into things and it's mainly down to just situational awareness and knowing what's around you. If you bump into something underwater, that can range from, you know, tapping your buddy with the tip of your fins or snapping off a piece of coral that's taken hundreds of years to grow. Ideally underwater, the only thing you should touch is the ladder to get out. Pay attention to the environment around you, in front of you, side to side, above and below, and as well as how things are moving, especially the water, so that current or surge isn't going to push you into anything and damage you or the reef. And don't bunch up too much. You have the huge entire ocean to dive in. I mean, don't separate from your buddy, but don't swim up too close to the diver in front of you. Just try to keep a good amount of distance from other things in the water and have in your mind, you know, where things are in relation to you so that you don't end up bumping into things. Not equalizing early or often enough. The best time to start equalizing your ears is actually in the car traveling to the dive site. That's how early. If you're five meters underwater when you start thinking about equalizing, that's far too late. And once you pass a certain depth, it can actually be impossible to equalize because the pressure imbalance can be holding the tube closed. And no matter how much you pinch your nose and blow, you won't equalize your ears. That's why you're taught to ascend a little bit and try again if you can't equalize. It's not about how hard you equalize, it's how early you equalize. Before you even jump in the water, give it a go. And that starts things to you know, get ready before the dive, it loosens things up. As soon as your head drops under the water, start equalizing there. You shouldn't feel much of anything and that's the point. If you do feel any kind of discomfort, then you've left it far too late. For the first 10 meters, try to be equalizing all the time as you descend. Generally, you can't over equalize your ears. Not asking silly questions. Uh, I've done this one before. I was stood opposite another diver on the dive boat and I thought to myself, if I should ask when the last time they tightened a, uh, a fitting on their regulator that I knew was prone to disconnecting over time, the screw just eventually works itself loose so you have to tighten it periodically. I knew that, but I didn't ask them. And as if by Murphy's law, Three minutes later, during the dive in front of me, the O-ring popped and we aborted the dive there and then. Nobody was hurt, but it always sticks in my mind to always bring something up if I see it, just in case. So if you're ever unsure about anything, or just a thought pops into your mind, just voice it out. It might just be the thing that makes someone go, huh, you know, let me check that or put your mind at ease. If there's something troubling you, then the worst thing to do is to clam up and try to ignore it. You'll learn more by asking questions and it might have a big difference down the road. And that's it for now. Uh, if I could ask something from you for uh, right now, I see that an alarming percentage of you wonderful people out there are not subscribed to the channel. So could you do me a favor of looking down underneath this video and seeing if you are or are not subscribed? And of course, please do subscribe. Uh, every Saturday we do a top 10 video from now on, whether that be top 10 dive computers last week or top 10 diving mistakes that new divers make this video. And tomorrow I do a Q&A on a Sunday where I chat about your questions so if you have any questions pop them down in the comments below and add the ask mark hashtag so that i can find it for next sunday after that think about heading over to scuba diver magazine.com where you can get one of our digital or print magazines we have three regional magazines we have the uk the us and australia new zealand magazines uh, we also have the spring store if you want a new diving tee or sweatshirt or something there should be a banner underneath this video with a handful of designs anyway that's it for this week. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Thank you for watching everybody and of course safe diving.